It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Dr. Rachel Bronson. Thank you. Good afternoon, morning, or evening to uh, those of you around the world calling in. Uh, we're delighted to be hosting Henry Sokolsky, the Executive Director of the Nonproliferation Policy Education <laughs> Center, who's joining us from Washington, D.C. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, as many of you know, have started these uh, calls to engage our followers and stakeholders from across the globe, and we've been delighted by the turnout. Uh, up until this point. This is our third uh, third effort at this, and we're delighted that Henry has agreed to join us uh, join us for this. Um, the The timing of the of the call is built around the release of his new book, Underestimated: Our Not So Peaceful Nuclear Future, um, which really asks the question of as we go through as we've been going through this Iran debate. Uh, are we right to focus just on that, as important as it is, or should we really be focused on what's coming? And Henry looks out and assesses the situation, and as we'll hear from his conversation uh, today, I'm sure, uh, points out a number of issues that, uh, that are likely coming our way and a future of proliferation that we should be very concerned about and addresses it and helps us kind of think through those issues. At the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, we thought this was a terrific um, thesis for us to explore, and we're just delighted to have Henry with us. You all know from um, signing up for this his bio, but as um, a reminder, he's the executive director, as I mentioned, of the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center. We were just discussing how the organization is now past its 20-year anniversary um, into its 21st. He has a long career working on nonproliferation issues. He's worked at senior levels at the Pentagon, um, most uh, at most senior levels as deputy for nonproliferation policy uh, under Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney, where he received a Medal of Outstanding Public Service. He's worked uh, with Andy Marshall in the Office of Net Assessment, and for those of you who have his book or have read it, you will see a very uh, a nice uh, introduction by Andy Marshall. And he's worked on a number of other commissions and as a consultant to the National Intelligence Council, uh, the CIA uh, has worked for the Central uh, CIA Senior Advisory Group and a number of others. So we're just delighted to have Henry with us. And as the operator mentioned, I'm going to turn it over to him now. He'll speak for a bit. Um, and then we will have time at the end to take um, some of your questions. So do be thinking of them as we go through. We view these offerings as being interactive um, as well as allowing us to um, profile some of uh, today's cutting edge thinkers. So with that, Henry, thank you for joining us. And let me, oh, let me just say one more thing. Uh, well, he's uh, an editor with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and he'll be writing this up. And so a summary of today's discussion proceedings will be on our website um, shortly, as well as a podcast of this exchange. So with that, Henry, thank you for joining us. And let me turn the, um, the call over to you. Well, thank you for having me. It's a distinct honor to be uh, spotlighted by your organization. I have uh, some distant memories of uh, when I was at the University of Chicago of actually going over on a daily basis to the bulletin to do my reading of the journals. They had all these wonderful magazines from the nuclear industry, and so I actually ended up working as an intern there. Uh, that's 40 <laughs> years ago, though. <laughs> So um, let me explain uh, a little bit about the book. Uh, this is the second of two books. The, the first I wrote was Best of Intentions, America's Campaign Against Strategic Weapons Proliferation. Now, that was quite a while ago. It was 17 years ago. I wrote that book uh, as a history, and I wrote it because I noticed when I was teaching there really was no critical history of nonproliferation. Uh, now, Kind of understandable, I suppose. I mean, at least I figured out why there wasn't a history when I started to think through how I would write one. It's not easy to write a history about things that didn't happen and then try to explain why mm. they didn't happen. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a, a, a sort of a, a no-go proposition. So what I did there was try to talk about each major initiative, group plan, 
Peace, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and several others. And what I did was try to look at what each of these initiatives thought the next war would look like and how mm -hmm. they thought we could avoid them, these wars. Now, a big takeaway from that history, and you can still get it, uh, I think it's uh, available uh, on the Internet, um, uh, that takeaway was simply this. If you get your vision of what the problem is wrong, you're probably not going to do all that well uh, in addressing the real problem by trying to address the phony one. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was an initiative called the Adams for Peace Program, and it actually compounded the problem of proliferation by spreading all kinds of technology way before it was useful to do uh, because it thought that the problem, the next war, had to do with massive stockpiles that would wipe out all of America's key cities. Like, uh, and, and so it was only concerned and worried about preventing large stockpiles. And it had this, this idea that if you got everyone using fizzle for power reactors, it would draw down everyone's ability to have a big stockpile to knock us out. That did not work out well. Now, this new book, uh, Underestimated, uh, is different. It's about the uh, future. Um, now there, uh, you know, I, I, the concern was similar to the one about history. You know, every serious social scientific field, economics, military science, even political science, uh, they tend to have not only critical histories where they, they talk about uh, what was done right or wrong in the past uh, in, in, in their area, but they have a, um, an eye towards um, using trends and identifying them to forecast into the future. Well, when you get to nonproliferation and the writings, uh, you don't find so much. What you get are discussions of current crises. You know, what's going on in Iran? What should we do next? Uh, and then you can fill in the slot. You could say Pakistan or you could say North Korea, wh whatever the current hot item is. But what you don't get enough of is an attempt to see what the trends have been and to try to at least uh, get the future wrong. I mean, we always do get the future wrong, I suppose, at some level. So, so, but, but that doesn't prevent us from trying. I could not find a book that did a good job of this. So that's the genius, if you will, or the, the genesis of, of this book. Now, what I did uh, was uh, to set out first to think about how bad things could get. And, you know, in this line of work, uh, there's a tendency, which I am totally guilty of, to make things look as bad as possible. And I think the reason why... I like doing that and why it makes some sense isn't so much to do a prediction because, you know, as I say, predicting the future, everybody knows it's kind of the track record in this regard is not terrific uh, for most of us. Um, but generally it can serve as something other than a precise prediction. It can serve as a warning. And if you get the warning right, you may not have the future that you predict. And that's okay. That would be good. So I, I, I tried to make things look about as bad as I could. And I'll give you, uh, I, I looked at a number of trends, uh, trends relating to deployed nuclear weapons, uh, trends regarding uh, fission, fission material stockpiles, the ability to, to increase them. Uh, I looked at missile delivery trends. Uh, I looked at uh, doctrine and how doctrines uh, relating to the use are changing. Uh, and then I looked at the spread of, of civil uh, dual-use technology. Uh, I think I identified most of the, of the, the key trends. Now, uh, just to give you a, a taste rather than go through all of those things, uh, one of the interesting trends, and I, what I do is I go back 50 years. I go back to roughly the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and look from there forward half century, you know, a good chunk of time. Now, if you go back and take a look uh, in 1962 or thereabouts, the numbers of weapons that were deployed by all sides is, is uh, interesting. Uh, the United States had as many as 24,000 weapons. Uh, Great Britain 
was the next country really to have an arsenal. France sort of had nuclear weapons, but like one or two. You know, every time it had a test, it lost its weapons arsenal. But but the British had about 50. And what's interesting is the order of magnitude difference between you know the, the sort of the the greatest nuclear arsenal and the the smallest uh, arsenal that that really was an arsenal. It was about three orders of magnitude different. Now, if you look today, a half century later or thereabouts, you know, the numbers are, you know, you can play with them, you know, what's deployed and not deployed, but you know, roughly several thousand uh, in the case of uh, the United States or Russia, and, you know, about 100 with regard to any country that's got an arsenal uh, that amounts to much, you know, Israel, Pakistan, India. And that's, you know, a little more than one order of magnitude. So what you're getting is a compression. Not only are the numbers slightly increasing about the number of countries, but the the differences in in the quantities between the the largest power, nuclear weapons power, and and sort of the smallest real arsenal of power, is is much more compressed. Now, that isn't necessarily all that interesting by itself, but then you combine it with a second trend. Second trend is that the amount of material that could be refashioned or fashioned into nuclear weapons and the amount of capacity to make more material has grown dramatically in the last half century. You know, back in 1962, uh, almost, well, I, I think you could just about say it, there wasn't any surplus material. Everything was fashioned into a bomb or into naval reactor fuel. I mean, we, we, didn't, we didn't just pile it up and say, well, maybe we'll use it later. For the most part, all of it went into, into some military application right away. Now, today, uh, that's not the case. Uh, in fact, uh, if you take a look, I don't know, Survival just came out with an article, and it claims that India has about 1,000 bombs worth of, of uh, plutonium. I, I think they're counting reactor grade plutonium, but, you know, India claims it tested a weapon with reactor grade, so it counts. Uh, Russia and the United States, meanwhile, have stockpiled, I don't know, tens of thousands of bombs worth of uranium and plutonium. Even Japan has roughly, I don't know, 1,800 bombs worth of uh, plutonium stockpiled aside. Uh, now, uh, this is interesting by itself, but then add to this, uh, some other figures. Um, if you take a look at what Japan and China, for example, are planning on serious <laughs> these plans are, uh, but we'll find out probably in a year or two, uh, the Japanese want to open up a plant at Wakasha. And that plant is a big chemical separation plant for plutonium or a processing plant, and it would make 1,600 weapons worth of plutonium a year, every year. China wants to do the same. It has right now stockpiled aside, you know, according to the only estimates that are publicly available, which I, mean, I don't know how good these estimates are, but, but if you go with them, the estimates are they have roughly about Four or five hundred bombs worth of plutonium stockpiled, and maybe five hundred bombs worth of uh, so highly rich uranium stockpiled. But it turns out the the Chinese want to make a copy of Rakasho themselves. They're, they're, they want they're negotiating with the French to have the French build this plant. That would enable them to have again a plant that makes you know one to two thousand bombs worth of plutonium a year. And then on top of it. Both of these countries have uh, enrichment programs. Now, right now, if you took, you know, all of the uh, enrichment capacity that the Chinese have and you made it dedicated bomb, um, you could make 500 bombs worth per year. Uh, but in five years, they plan to be able to make, with that capacity, uh, enough material that if you convert it into bombs, it would be like 2,500 bombs. And you could say, oh, well, but they're going to use it all for, for power. That's not even true. It turns out that there's going to be a surplus uh, of about 3 million SWUs, uh in 2020. And that's equal to roughly, I don't know, several hundred to a thousand bombs worth. Now, this is a different world. 
By the way, the Japanese uh, have you know surplus enrichment capacity too. Because I, I don't know whether they need their enrichment capacity for their power program, and, and they've got a program. What this means is there's material hanging around that could be fashioned into bombs, and there's capacity for civil purposes that could be repurposed. That was not the case a half century ago. Now, pointed out these trends. You can read the rest of the book. It's grim reading. Uh, you know, if you want to worry, you know, there's plenty to work with. <laughs> you know, and I, I and I put this thing out. As a, as a chapter uh, all by itself as a major article in something called The Next Arms Race. And it had a bit of a following. Uh, I noticed that one person who I know used to read everything I, I wrote, uh, former Secretary Rumsfeld, uh, cribbed, seemed to be cribbing one of my phrases. I said, well, there might be a sprint to equality. You know, as people come down the U.S. and Russia, maybe someone will come up. And so he referred to a, a, a sprint to parity. So I, he may have read it, you know, I, I don't know. But all in all, I have to say, uh, I thought the book would have, or at least that chapter would have more of an impact. Because everyone was talking about going down to zero. And here I was laying out, well, but there's all this latent capacity. And I thought, oh, well, this, this would really catch on. I don't think it did. Not so much. Um, and so, you know, I guess I decided to put the whole book project aside because I couldn't quite figure out what I was doing here. And I've been working on this for about 17 years, so I figured what was another year or so. You know, I mean, put it aside. Then I got a call from John Mearsheimer's office at the University of Chicago where I, I once went to school, and they asked me to give a talk. And they said, well, you want to give a talk on something you're working on, and I couldn't quite figure out, well, okay, what am I going to do? And then it dawned on me, oh, I know what I'll do. Why don't I look at what everyone else is thinking? Uh, because if I find out what everyone else is thinking about nuclear weapons and their spread, maybe I can figure out why nobody thinks very much about what I'm doing. <laughs> you know? So <laughs> I reread, you know, all of the famous essays uh, on these things, and, and I and read a lot of new things. It was quite interesting. And I kind of backed into a discovery that I didn't expect. And it roughly was this. It really didn't matter which of the, I think they're roughly around three schools that uh, fought on, on these matters. Whether you read the school that was opposed to nuclear weapons in their spread, which is roughly what most governments now think, and the arms control community certainly is uh, a subscriber to, or if you read the hawkish supporters of nuclear weapons who wanted to hold on to uh, the nuclear weapons that they had, or improve them. Uh, and, and you know, with regard to the spread of nuclear weapons, generally against it, except maybe to a few friends. I mean, they had, the, you know, this sort of that problem. Or you read the what I call the radical academic skeptics. These, these people uh, adorn themselves with the uh, self-serving title of being realists. I don't know how realistic they are, but, but they say that. And these folks believe that uh, nuclear proliferation is either good or inconsequential because either weapons automatically deter one another or uh, they think that nuclear deterrence never works. Now, it doesn't matter which of these schools you look at. There's one thing you discover right away. They're all pretty confident that if you just follow their advice, things will be as good as they can be and they'll be pretty good or maybe even optimal. I thought that was kind of wild. I mean, you know, it <laughs> it seemed, <laughs> seemed kind of, uh, I won't say arrogant, but, but misguided. I mean, how many data points do we have for nuclear weapons? Two. That was a long time ago. How much, you know, how much can you know on the basis of that much of experience? Uh, you can, you can, you can, um, how shall I put it, speculate, yeah? Theorize. But it's not like you've got a, a rich database. You, know, you can't do a big regression analysis on two points. Okay, I mean, you can, but it's silly. I wouldn't recommend it. So I looked at this stuff, and I thought this is interesting. Now, I have to say, if you take a look at each one of these schools more closely, I think what you discover is each has something really interesting to say that you really ought to think about. 
And then it has some kind of flaw or something that's not, it's mildly tragic that you should be aware of. And what this means, I think, roughly, is you don't pick a school unless you're a fool. And you don't square the difference between these schools. Uh, it, it, it's it's, it's going to be harder to figure out what sound policy would require than just doing that. Let, let's just go briefly uh, through uh, these schools. Uh, now, the, the crowd that wants to go to zero, they have something, I think, that their critics don't allow enough credit for. They have a truth that is very, very interesting. And that is that zero is a really interesting number. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you were to get all of the leaders of the countries that have nuclear weapons and you told them, look, we're not going to let you leave this room until you agree on one number that you think would be optimal, I can't imagine they would ever get out alive uh, unless they hit upon the number. And what would the number be to get out of that room? Well, I'm pretty sure it'd be zero. Now, whether they would agree to do it or figure out how to do it, uh, I'm not so sure about. But that that number might be the one they would hit upon, I think is pretty likely. I think that's pretty interesting. And I think the critics of zero probably don't give enough credit to the power of that point. Now, that said, the people who write about this uh, I think do a pretty good job of explaining, uh, you know, how you might go down some. They do a great job on explaining what the benefits of going to zero would be. They even do a pretty good job of explaining uh, how you might stay at zero and prevent folks from going backwards and getting weapons. What they don't do very well, however, uh, and I would argue, I guess, do a poor job of, is explaining the risks of the transition from a, a certain relatively low number to zero. I mean, once you get to, you know, uh, you know a thousand or a few hundred, and then you try to go down further, uh, there's a lot of fear and loathing about that transition. And how you do it uh, is something that deserves a lot more serious attention. I don't know that they do as good of a job as they need to on that. Now, when you get to the hawkish supporters of nuclear weapons, uh, they have a really interesting point, and one that I don't think the critics of nuclear weapons give enough credence to, and that is that somehow uh, they argue these weapons and the threat of using them, and, and even the indiscriminate use of them, has somehow kept the peace or prevented certain forms of aggression. Now, it's very hard to prove, again, why something hasn't happened. So there's something, you know, inherently unsatisfying about this argument. But it doesn't strike me as wrong-headed to think there might be something to it. It's just the question is determining, well, how much? Now, here I have to say um, one, of the, one of the misgivings, uh, you have to have when you read the, the supporters of nuclear weapons is that they make arguments that are pretty unqualified. I mean, uh, I remember reviewing someone's work uh, who I would argue was one of these people, and they made an argument about how many things were avoided, uh, how many wars were avoided or, or clashes were avoided by threatening to use nuclear weapons. It's quite a long list. You know, it may not be that that was the actual list in truth, but you know, you got to figure maybe maybe he was right a few of the times, and, and if he was right any of the times, it was interesting. Uh, but then it, it more or less was said that when we had more of these weapons and threatened to use them more often, we we prevented and deterred more aggressions. Okay, so that would suggest that more is better than uh, less. Then then the argument went to well, you know, you really want to know your your weapons are reliable. And so that sort of leads to the argument, you want to make sure they're as good as possible. So more is better, better is better, and then you've got to wonder, well, if that's what helps deter, wouldn't it make sense to share some of these with your friends, right? Well, it turns out, depending on who you're talking about, each country has different friends. <laughs> 
Well, you, you then find yourself in this, uh, this really dark place where you're arguing for the spread of these things. I don't even think the proponents of nuclear weapons are totally comfortable with that. But they haven't figured out, I think, sufficiently how to argue coherently about what is enough and why you have to stop at some point. Uh, now, they also, I think, go a little too far in dismissing something that the zero crowd, I think, makes way too much of. Uh, the zero crowd likes saying, well, uh, they don't like talking really about deterrence because they, they say, well, weapons are only good to deter, and when you press them on that, next thing you know, it turns into an argument for getting nuclear weapons. So they, you know, they, they try to change the subject, and they say, well, but at least you don't want to have nuclear weapons because they might get cause accidents or they might be illicit use, and that'd be terrible. And then they go so far as to say that it's most immediate and extreme threat. Uh, I think it's possible. I don't think it's immediate or ex ex the most extreme threat. After all, a nuclear exchange could be much worse than losing just the city. Uh, but they like arguing this. I think this... The, 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 the proponents of nuclear weapons I, uh, go the other route. They say, well, it hasn't happened so far, and if we just keep doing more or less due diligence, it shouldn't happen in the future. That strikes me as perhaps excessive in the other direction. It, 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 it's a bet against the house. I mean, you know, we've had some close calls. And the idea that it will never be a problem in the future, that doesn't sound right either. Now, finally, the last group, which is my favorite, uh, is the radical academic skeptics. And the reason I like them is they are sort of professional sophists in a sense. They make strong arguments weak and weak arguments strong. And when they attack the conventional wisdom, uh, particularly in the capitals of the Western world, they have a lot to work with. And as a result, they end up saying things that sound to me not only thought-provoking, but probably right. <laughs> I mean, they... they uh, they question, I think rightly, how immediate or extreme the threat of nuclear terrorism is. Uh, they question how far you can push the argument of deterrence, uh, at least in, in the school uh, that uh, questions deterrence being really a factor at all. And, and, and you know, the, the whole question of what, what kept the peace uh, uh, in the um, Cold War, they, they point to alliances, which is a counter-argument, and it's not like it can be proved to be wrong. It may, it may be, and maybe that is it. Uh, they also question what caused the end of the Second World War. Did we really need to use nuclear weapons? So all this is a very helpful, thought-provoking uh, romp, and I would encourage anyone teaching to assign these books. I do. I, I require them. There's one in particular that I like, um, John Mueller. Uh, nuclear Obsession. I, I think it's a pretty good book. Now, the problem a little bit with these books is they go too far, and they over-argue again. And so, you know, one of the things that Mr. Mueller does, and, and I, I've talked to him about this, is he argues that the Iraq War was caused by non-proliferation. Now, I worked in the Pentagon during the first war. I can assure you that that was not my view. <laughs> I mean, there were many things going on that made us get into that war, but I don't think it was non-proliferation, and one could go even further uh, with regard to the second engagement that that was the case. But the other thing that, that I find kind of odd is there are arguments about, well, you know, the, the, the non-proliferation is actually evil because it prevents people from enjoying the benefits of nuclear power. Uh, with all due respect, I think the jury is at least out as to what those benefits are, and in some places you could lose a lot of money enjoying those benefits. So I, I think all that's a little over, overdone. Now, uh, I think also the, the, this crowd underestimates and does not discuss what the transition far from zero to, to even one nuclear weapon, much less one to a larger number. I mean, you could get bombed at. And if you take a look at history, you know, the Iranians and the Iraqis, the Syrians, uh, you know, know about this. And there were all sorts of plans to, to do things maybe against China, maybe against Pakistan. So there's some history here, and they don't talk about that. All right, let me wrap up. Uh, in Washington, uh, the, the question that is asked is a little different than it is uh, in New York. In New York, the question you're asked roughly in conversation 
is how much do you actually make per year? <laughs> it's all about how rich you are going to be. In California, where I'm from, uh, they, they have a different set of questions. They say, how do you feel? What are you into? Uh, Jerry Mello. In Washington, the question is, where are you now? Uh, by the way, this is code for, why should I talk to you? How can you help me get my next job? Right? So I have to tell you where I am. I'm, I'm in Washington. And where I am is not in any one of these three schools. I think where I am, I think, is common sense, and I don't suppose it's that radical position. Fewer of these weapons in fewer hands strikes me as desirable. Uh, how you get there, however, matters. You want things to be as transparent as possible so that everyone knows what everyone else is doing. Uh, and it is actually useful to organize one's foreign and military affairs towards this goal. Uh, in other words, I don't think this is just a feel nice thing. I think it's important for international security that you do this. Now, having said that, how you go about it gets to the third chapter of this book. By the way, I just described the first chapter, which is what we think, and the middle chapter, where we're headed. The last chapter is what might help. Uh, by the way, emphasis on the word might. <laughs> not sure if you follow my advice, you're going to be home free. But it might help. Uh, I talk about a number of things. Uh, one would be uh, we need to start focusing our arms control much more uh, to Asia. Uh, not only Southwest Asia, but East Asia as well. Because the center of gravity, not only demographically, but economically, politically, militarily, is shifting in that direction. Most of our arms control and nonproliferation efforts, however, were focused and forged on problems of Western Europe uh, and, and even uh, North and, and South America and Africa. Uh, we need to move towards Asia. And in that regard, we need to focus a lot more on the main event, which I think is China. Uh, now, China admittedly uh, does not seem to have many nuclear weapons. I think it doesn't. Uh, I wish we knew better what they have. Uh, but they are acquiring a heck of a lot of missiles. In fact, if you count the number of MTCR missiles they have, they have more missiles than anybody else. I always like to point this out to them and say, well, maybe we can't talk about nuclear controls because we have to come down, but let's talk about missiles. That's the second suggestion. We need to talk a bit more about missiles and their control. We're not doing that. And there's some good suggestions that have been made by Russians, by actually Indians and Pakistanis and Americans, and it's, it would be useful to start exploring those more seriously. I also argue for fizzle controls, which is an old saw. Uh, I would start in East Asia. Uh, the United States is about, I hope, to decide to put off its own use of plutonium for commercial purposes in its MOX plant down Savannah River. Where Kasha was about to open, it would be good if it didn't. Can we have a timeout? It would be good if the Chinese didn't go forward. It's not in their five-year plan to go forward with a fast reactor or breeder program or a reprocessing program. Maybe we should just hold off. And, of course, South Korea is, is pondering off. Finally, uh, I argue and make a case for getting acting on proliferation problems before they hit the newspapers, uh, on first indications, before you have clear proof. And when you have that early indication, you don't have to do anything as desperate uh, as some military action or some covert operation. But the longer you wait, the, the uglier your options are, diplomatically or militarily. And I would argue that, and, and hardly least, uh, I think a case has to be made for using international law more. Uh, each country should try as best it can to serve its own purposes by trying to figure out rules that apply to everyone. I think we ought to uh, have a competition there. That isn't to give up on each country's national security or sovereignty, but to, to, to use international rules as a way to promote them. Uh, I think that's something our diplomacy needs to do better at. It, 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 uh, it, not great at that. Now, you could say, look, that's terrific. Uh, sounds overly ambitious. Well, it might be. If it is, all I can say is that middle chapter doesn't look like a warning so much. It looks more like a prediction then. So, with that, I conclude. Henry, thank you so much. Uh, it's given us a lot to... Um 
think about and uh, talk about. I'm going to just be mindful of time and wanting to give people the opportunity. Let me just turn it, David, over to the operator and see if, uh, if there are any questions from the uh, floor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the floor is open for your questions. If you would like to ask a question, you may do so now by pressing star 1 on your touchtone phone. We'll take questions in the order they are received. If at any time you would like to remove yourself from the question queue, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, press star 1 now. Our first question comes from Ori Natham Levy. Hi, this is Mr. Levy from Israel. Very, very interesting, and so thank you for, for giving me the opportunity. I, um, at the current time, I'm doing my PhD research on, uh, on, on the operational nuclear defense model, and I have two questions. If I have the time, I would like to ask the third one. And I would like to ask you, please, Mr. Sikorsky, if you could first answer in yes or no, and then elaborate. And my first question, do you think, and I, I, uh, I put in parenthesis that by what you said, I definitely intend to read your book. I didn't do it yet, but uh, so I can see the direction you're going or some directions, but I would like to ask you a direct question. Do you think there will be a nuclear war? This is the first question. And the second question, if, you, if your answer is yes, will it be one or two bombs or an overall catastrophic event? I don't know. That's, that's the answer to that one. Our next question comes from James Guerrero. Oh, yes. I've se recently seen some movement to take nuclear fuel for civilian power reactors from the typical 3.5% to 20% to get more power. Can you comment on this? Uh, I don't think the problem with nuclear reactor design is going to be that easily addressed by increasing the power in the core. The problems with nuclear power and their economics, their safety, and their proliferation resistance uh, turn on many other things. So I, I'm kind of hoping that that's not the case. It, it uh, certainly would complicate uh, a lot of the, the nuclear proliferation and nuclear security questions if you had to go to higher enrichment to make nuclear power work. My suspicion is you don't. But I, I am not a nuclear engineer, and uh, I'm going on the basis of what I've heard other people talk about. Thank you. And Henry, just on this, I think just to confirm, confirming your point, I think that part of getting back on the Iran deal, the, the reason it was capped at the 3.86 or wherever it was capped power, uh, keeping it from the nuclear weapon, which I think supports your view on that as well. Yeah, I think that the problem there isn't the, that's a, a very different point, though. I think that, you know, that's some, the critics of that deal would say that's wishful thinking because once you're enriching at all uh, and you're worried only about one weapon, uh, you're, you're in a terribly bad place. And the, the minor adjustments between 3 or 4 or 5 percent and 20 percent is, is interesting, but not at all as positive as to whether you're enriching at all. <laughs> so that be a little trickier for, for at least a, a wider audience of critics and proponents. That battle gets gets very uh, difficult. Our next question comes from Bruce Goodwin. And could I ask the people calling in to identify themselves just um, so that everybody on the call knows where um, where the question is coming from, both literally and in general? Hi, uh, <clears throat> it's Bruce Goodwin at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, Mr. Sokolsky, would you comment on recent or developing confusion over the um, utility of reactor grade plutonium for weapons utilization versus the nuclear industry's drive for closing the fuel cycle? Well, there's long been a problem, and I, I want to say this uh, emerged in the, in the I'd say, uh, late 60s on, 
there has been this will to nuclear power that comes with the argument that we shouldn't be held back by any nuclear proliferation concerns. And since the most popular reactors are light water reactors, and they do have certain uh, proliferation, uh, or I should say non-proliferation uh, uh, features that are, that are desirable. You have to shut the whole reactor down, for example, to get at any fuel that's in it. Uh, they've kind of pushed the argument to, oh, well, you wouldn't want to use anything from a power reactor to make a bomb because it has um, undesirable, even isotopes of plutonium. And this is to protect the promotion of the export and building of more white water reactors. Now, I think the problem is, is this. Um, in making that argument, they're overriding uh, clear studies, determinations, and statements by weapons designers that while maybe in 1945 was the first design, reactor-grade plutonium, which has, you know, these even isotopes in them, because they, 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 some of the materials sat around and transmuted itself, if you will, with, uh, into uh, uh, having a lot of 240 and 242 instead of 241 and 239 isotopes, that while it's true that in the case of the, the design of 1945, it would be complicating, and with the explosives that were very crude uh, and heat sensitive and, and, and 1945, it would be complicated. It does not follow that it really is much of a problem, uh, you know, so many years later, you know, 70 years later. Lots of technology has changed. Also, uh, the ability to deliver these weapons accurately means you don't need a very big weapon. So... I think the need to pay attention to India's claim that it's exploded a reactor-grade uh, device deserves attention. I think they did that because they said, hey, this stuff we think could be used in, in bombs. I understand that we tested a device with reactor-grade material just to show that it could be done in the, in the 60s. And there's a bigger point, and that is that even light water reactors can be operated slightly different than they are normally operated. Instead of opening them up every 12 or 18 months, you could open them up 9 or 10 months. And the, the, the material in there would be mostly weapons grade. Now, we need to pay more attention to that as countries that might want to go nuclear or ramp up the size of their stockpile get more heavily invested and involved in recycling and uh, getting more light water reactors. You want to be very, very certain that, that the recycling, which is not uh, necessary to promote nuclear power and actually costs so much more money than buying fresh fuel, it's not a wise bank investment, that people stay away from that. You want to have nuclear power and you don't want to have bombs, you're going to have to double down on this point. We are losing our touch for remembering the point, much less doubling down on it. Our next question comes from Edward Kocklenberg. Hi, uh, Edward Kocklenberg. I've been a consultant for the Energy Department on nuclear reactor economics and uh, am retired now, but I've been following this issue fairly closely. Uh, the nuclear industry recently released a report which uh, for people who are pro-nuclear power plant uh, is somewhat dissuading. It suggests that because of distributed power and a few other technological changes, uh, baseload plants are going to find themselves, particularly nuclear ones, uh, less desirable. If industry starts moving away or closing down or not building new nuclear power plants in this country, it probably is due to economics, uh, obviously some political pressure. This may also uh, occur, well, it has occurred in Sweden and Germany to some extent. Uh, what will this hold for uh, other countries who are perhaps running the reactor to uh, extract plutonium 
uh, no reactor. Uh, then what happened? Uh, could you comment on that, please? Uh, let me see if I understand the question. You're asking if nuclear power falls uh, in disfavor in advanced economies, uh, what will this mean uh, for countries that want to get nuclear weapons? I want to make sure I understand your question. Yeah, I think that's probably a more succinct way of my long question. Thank you. Okay. Well, I mean, how shall I put it? You're an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds, that sounds terrific to me, but I, I don't know that that's going to happen, uh, and certainly not very quickly. Even if it does. And, and the reason why is, first of all, uh, utility systems tend to have a very heavy hand uh, on, on the controls by government, uh, at least regulatorily or even financially. Mm -hmm. And, yes. it, you know, market forces tend to be sort of the last thing we we resort to if we can't figure out what to do. <laughs> it's not the first thing. <laughs> so God's invisible hand, according to Adam Smith, which is market forces, is not heavily weighing on the scale uh, here quite yet. I think it's beginning to. Uh, second, uh, surely, though, uh, I'm going to concede your point, which is if nuclear power becomes extremely popular, I think the ability to control uh, these things probably is not very great. I'll be honest. Uh, and so I think trying to at least be honest and true to the market signal is important because maybe we have to, you know, uh, let ourselves go, so to speak, because it's just so uh, economically imperative. But if it isn't, boy, there are a lot of reasons besides economics to be careful here particularly in places like the Middle East. I could not believe that our Secretary of Energy was promoting small nuclear reactors in his conversations with the Iranians. I mean, what the world? They are, they are sitting on so much natural gas. That is not something they need to play with for at least a couple of weeks. Yeah? So I think paying attention to market forces will, will keep us honest. It may be that we have to go with nuclear power. I'm not persuaded, obviously, but I think we need to be honest about it one way or the other. Thank you. Our next question comes from Douglas Riley. Hello. Uh, this is Doug Riley from Los Alamos, New Mexico. Actually, Mr. Zukowski, you and I have met a few times. But oh, okay. What? Yeah, the last time you were visiting Los Alamos, I think under the invitation of Jim Tate. But any event, I... Yes, my question is, would you just discuss Israel's nuclear arsenal and delivery capability, just in a few sentences? But I would just comment on a previous question about using uh, reactor-grade plutonium. One time, because I worked in the safeguard non-proliferation and such for the IEA, DOE, Los Alamos, and we invited a weapons designer to give us an unclassified talk on that. And he said, well, you know, at Livermore and Los Alamos, we try to make really sophisticated devices that are small. But if all you want is a big bang, you'll do yourself proud with reactor grade plutonium. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think we need to get all of those folks uh, Get me their names, I'll fly them out, and uh, we'll put them on display and up on Capitol Hill. I, I think your point, obviously, is something I violently agree with. It's just it's not clear to most people here within the Beltway or other capitals that that technically is the case. Uh, yeah, hey, I think you're better. Yeah. So uh, let's get back to your question. Your question was Israel. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, I've written with Victor Galinsky, who's done much more work than I, uh, right. on this. And, you know, we are backing into to our brief having to somehow concede that, of course, they have nuclear weapons. And uh, I think there are a lot of legal reasons having to do with uh, having to spend foreign aid and military aid that makes it very difficult to be candid about this. But we don't. I'm not a member of the government. <laughs> I don't have a problem talking about it. Uh, there is one big thought that I'd like to share with you. Uh, I once met with someone fairly senior in the Israeli foreign ministry, and, of course, we couldn't quite talk about the topic. 
traffic for obvious reasons. But I said, you know, I could imagine that you really need to focus on uh, the question of how to get rid of nuclear weapons, uh, very much in, in, in the case of Israel. Uh, and I said, I said, I think it's a very important topic. And I said, I explained, she kind of looked at me quizzically, and, and I said, well, let me explain. I said, after all, if Israel becomes a normal state and actually makes uh, the Arab citizens in its midst more or less equals, and, I mean, they, they, they certainly are, you know, divided in their opinion on how to do that, but, I mean, it, it isn't as though it's clear that they won't become a normal state. You're going to want to get rid of these things at some point when it turns out more of your population is Arab than, 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 uh, than Jewish. Uh, and I, I said that, you know, this could happen in the next 50 years or less. I think we need to keep that in mind. Thank you. Well, we, That's a very yeah. interesting comment. So I think we're coming to the end of our time. If there's if there's still a question in the queue, I think we should take a last question. And if not, we should probably begin to close close out. Our last question will come from Ori Natham Levy. Hi. This is this is uh, the third question. I'll be I'll try to be nicer because the backfire I got before. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, question, the third question is um, why so uh, few people or countries all over the world are less uh, talking about defense from nuclear that, that's my Say question that again on, on the question ok I'm saying why, why uh, do you think that uh, many or very few countries and people all over the world talking or taking measure uh, of, of about the topic of defense from nuclear weapons. Uh, so is the question, why aren't more people talking about defenses against nuclear weapons? Is that the question? No, no. Why, why very few, if at all? I'm so saying why everybody... Is so is, 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 why, why are so few uh, talking about uh, defending against nuclear weapons? Is that the question? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That's my question. Thank you. Well, I mean, part of the problem is somebody who's promoted missile defense is for a long time. Yeah, they're really expensive, and so far, you know, they don't work real well. <laughs> and so we, we try to do as best we can. You know, it isn't like you wouldn't, I mean, I don't think during the Battle of Britain, that, you know, radar was expensive, and so were air, defense, air, air defenses, and they didn't work perfectly. They didn't, I don't think Churchill, you know, sat around saying, oh, well, well then we shouldn't do it. I mean, so, so we do missile defenses, but it's, it's not easy. And it's uh, at least so far, that may change. Uh, and so, so part of it is is that the is that the quality uh, and the expense associated with these defenses is not where it needs to be to be popular. So talking about it doesn't become so popular. I think also um, there is something about nuclear weapons that still, unfortunately, is true. <laughs> Admittedly, military planners, uh, certainly in the States, when they think about targeting these things, they, they, they don't, I, at least I don't think they think about targeting cities. They think about targeting silos or underground tunnels with missiles in them or, or any number of you know, military targets where you hope that the number of innocents that might be killed won't be very high. But not everybody thinks that way. First of all, second of all, as longer a war goes on that gets bloody, the more reckless and, and emotional you know, people become. And you could fire these things at cities, and it's really hard to defend against. Uh, you know, if all you want to do is hit a, a big area target, it, it, the defenses, uh, you know, are really going to be have to be very, very good to prevent be 100 percent. So there really is something still troubling about nuclear weapons. They're not just another bullet, yeah? as Eisenhower tried to argue. They're not. Okay, thank you. Well, Henry, yeah. on behalf of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, I want to thank you for taking the time to um, engage with us on this. And for those on the call, many of, uh, of you are now uh, repeat joiners. We're really thankful for that. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us and giving us cause to bring people like Henry 
to us and to have this conversation. So um, as we close out, I want to thank both those on the phone and Henry in particular. Thank you for um, stimulating this conversation. I have a bunch of emails that have also come in that I'll forward your way as people who are unable to stay on the whole call and all of that. But thank you very much for these great questions, and thank you, Henry, for the presentation today. Well, thank you. And as a reminder, a uh, write-up of this will be on our website shortly, as well as the podcast for those who want to go back, uh, re rewind, and hear some piece of it again. So on behalf of the bulletin, everybody have a good day uh, at Be Well, and we'll look out for future calls like this. Bye-bye.